Okay, I'm supposed to follow that by uh, telling you for a few minutes about a project that uh, we've been working on in the same space um, that uh, has gotten a twist in the last couple of months because of the war in Ukraine. So, uh, most of you see me as a, as a host here, but uh, my main job day today is that of a neuroscientist. And uh, PopTech is the place where a project that I've been working on for the last two years has started. So back in 2017 at PopTech, uh, we had two speakers uh, who spoke in different sessions, but the one thing that was common to both of them was that the two of them won the Nobel Prize that year. One of them won the Nobel Prize in Peace and the other one in Physics, and they both spoke about their respective fields. And then we said, you know, if we have two people who won the Nobel Prize and they're both here, why don't we have an impromptu session where we just talk about winning the Nobel Prize? How does it feel? How does it work? How do you get the, the message? How, how do you, who instructs you what to do? And so on. And we got an interesting session sitting on the stage and kind of talking to the three of us about their experience of winning the Nobel Prize. And at some point I asked them a question and I said, you know, now that you won this um, major award, everything you say gets a lot of news and headlines and what things do you use this kind of voice that you have to, to impact? And the two of them said uh, at the same time, we, we're concerned about nuclear wars and we're trying to do something about that. Now, it wasn't surprising that the uh, person who won the Peace Prize for abolishing nuclear weapons uh, uh, Beatrice Finn said that. This is, I think, what you would expect. It was most surprising that the other person who was a physicist said that given that he was not in the nuclear space, he had to do with LIGO, the gravitational waves detector, and it didn't seem like something that he cared about in his history before publicly. So it was interesting and it stood out to me that they said that and I thought, oh, that's interesting that they said it. And it reminded me that just that year, uh, back then, President Obama was also asked a similar question. He, he was asked in an interview, what keeps you up at night? What are you most worried about? And he said back then that what worries him the most was the chances of nuclear uh, weapons getting in the wrong hands in Pakistan. Now, back then, there were many things that were uh, of concern to Americans. And it was also surprising to me when he said that because it didn't seem like it's a major news item at the time. And both those cases stood out to me because they felt not what I expected. And I said, how strange it is that something uh, like that comes up in a conversation. I didn't think about it before and I moved on. You probably wish now that I was on Zoom and there was a buffering issue that slowed me down. Uh, 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 um. So it kind of stood out to me that uh, those two cases were people saying something that I didn't think about and I moved on. And about uh, a few months after PropTech in uh, January 13, 2018, some of you may remember, there was this moment where if you were living in Hawaii uh, in the morning at about 7.45, you would get a text message on your phone that says that a missile is coming from North Korea and about to hit the island and kind of said something, please take shelter, this is not drill. And Hawaiian, for about 45 minutes that morning, got to live this experience of what would you do if you only had 40 minutes to live? This game that you play next to the bonfire as a kid, they actually were living that because this was the alert on everyone's phone until at around 8.30, the alarm was dismissed and some intern lost his job for this mistake. And this case too made me think, oh wow, there. There are people who, when they get a message that says that a nuclear missile is potentially coming at them, instead of saying, no, this is, this is, of course, a mistake, they actually think it could happen. So they kind of look at themselves and they say, yeah, I guess this is what's happening right now. We have missiles coming from North Korea and that's it. No one said, like, this makes no sense in the people that were interviewed. And all of that made me think, again, that it's strange that, that nuclear things are in our life, uh, again, uh, this is again before the war in Ukraine, and I was baffled by that and forgot about it. And the third and fourth time I heard about nuclear and it came to me was in January 7, 2020. So you probably all know what happened not far from here in January 6, 2020. What's less known uh, was that a day after the events of uh, the capital uh, resurrection, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs called his counterpart in China and said, look, I'm worried that the situation in my country is going to escalate quickly to maybe a, a launch of a nuclear weapon uh, as a way to kind of uh, do something to interfere with the elections. I want to tell you uh, that I'm going to do anything possible to stop this from happening. And if you do see something that looks like there's a nuclear escalation in the US, 
call me first, I will uh, uh, t tell you what to do. Now, um, this, um, th there is no evidence that there ever was a chance that the US would launch nuclear weapon as a way to stay in power, but just the fact that this conversation happened and it made it to some kind of news item made me for the fourth time think about the chances of nuclear weapons being used and why I think about it for a few minutes, consider that as a serious threat and then move on to something else. And as a neuroscientist, what I took from that is that it's a f failure of our brains. Our brains uh, are good in living in the here and now, but less so in thinking about things that are on different scales. We have a hard time thinking about things that are very, very small, like quantum effects. We have a hard time thinking about things that are very, very big, like the universe or infinity or things that are kind of far in space or uh, in time. And we also have a hard time thinking about ourselves in the future, uh, imagining how it would be to be, say, 60 years older than you are right now, is really hard for our brain. All we can do is say, I'm me, but call me now 60 years older. That's about it. We can't really imagine how it would be to think differently or walk differently or really have issues that you can't really anticipate. And in that sense, the fact that I kept thinking, oh, this is strange and scary and weird for a second and then moved on and forgot about it and kept going on my life is an indication how difficult it is for our brain to imagine catastrophes at what neuroscientists call our low, high risk, low probability events. So because of those events and thanks to the support of a lot of people that are sitting here, we decided to apply for a big grant uh, that we got two years ago that is all about using the knowledge we got from neuroscience to actually help uh, rethink the US nuclear launch protocols. Uh, we figured that the same way we have a hard time thinking about high risk low probability events, maybe senior people, including people in the uh, government nearby, are having a challenge with that. And maybe we can bring some of the knowledge that neuroscientists and behavioral economists and people in my field have gathered in the last couple of years to uh, help the government maybe rethink how they approach the big decisions of a nuclear launch. And when we started this, we didn't imagine how relevant it would become. So what we did first was because we weren't many of us experts in nuclear, we were experts in brain and thinking, we just called people and asked senior people in the government and in various countries to help us uh, talk about how they think about that. So we spoke to people in Russia, in even North Korea, in China, of course, many Americans. Uh, we spoke with people, with people in the government, we spoke with people uh, in di diplomats, we spoke with academics, uh, with a lot of technology in individuals, and asked all of them the same question, pretty much. If you were to invent a new protocol for how to think about nuclear launch, how would you do that? And we got a lot of answers. Because it was the pandemic, most of the conversations happened over Zoom, but as uh, the, the pandemic started to wane, we also got a chance to uh, meet some of the people in person and ask them questions. And because uh, two friends of mine were Hollywood producers and they said, you know, you get audience with some senior people, maybe you'll even get to speak to the presidents and has, ask them questions about how they think, uh, we should film that. So over the last year and a half, we started filming the interviews and gradually we got more and more interesting takes from very senior people who told us how when they were in the room where decisions like that were made, they were thinking about them. We spoke to uh, chiefs of staff we, uh, for the US presidents. We spoke to uh, the person in Russia who was in the room where at some point there was a, an error and he was told to launch something by mistake and did not. We spoke to people in uh, India who uh, load the e warheads into the missiles and kind of got to see how they approach that. And we spoke to a lot of people and it culminated in, with the fact that a few months ago when the war in Ukraine began, we actually got contacted by some of the biggest uh, network streaming in the country who said, you have footage that everyone now wants. Can you make it into a movie that will be accessible out there? And what I want to show you is a trailer for this movie that we uh, have. And I want to share with you that in the beginning, we had a hard time finding the right people, but as the movie progressed and some people started hearing about our film, we are now getting calls from uh, people, including a former president, President Obama, whose team said, we want to now be interviewed for your film and give you our perspective on how 
the president was thinking about it. So now it's reversed. We have now more people chasing us to tell us what they think about it because apparently many of them, as they leave office or as they get to reflect on that, have takes on what decisions are, how they would change them, and how the recent events are uh, making them rethink the way their brain works when they make decisions. So if we can show uh, the two minutes trailer, uh, this would be a good kind of indication to where the war is uh, taking us. War in Ukraine has begun. President Putin has ordered Russian military commanders to put the country's strategic nuclear forces on special alert, their highest level. The escalation risk with a nuclear power is severe. Think of the biggest choice you made in your life. Maybe it was the choice who to marry or where to live or what to study or who to vote for. Most of our choices, even the ones we think are critical, end up having small impact on the world. There are a few choices though that can change the trajectory of humanity as a whole. One of those choices is the decision to launch nuclear weapons. Thomas Schell applied game theory to thinking about nuclear powers and created the idea of mutually assured destruction, or what is known as deterrence theory. Deterrence is the practice of dissuading an adversary with threats. And it's predicated on one big assumption. All the leaders in the game are rational. I really love game theory. It's a beautiful way to think about the world. But we also have to understand that while it gives some insights and it's important, building a world assuming that game theory, the hyper-rational version of game theory is absolutely correct, is a little bit dangerous. The biggest challenge in my experience in this nuclear decision process is number one, potentially the compressed time decision cycles. Is it an intercontinental ballistic missile half a world away? Is it a submarine launch scenario immediately off the coast? Now you're down into some number of minutes. The significance of the activity combined with the really compressed timelines to make a decision, that is some real pressure. I mean, that is some real pressure if you're a decision maker. should have the control of this superpower. There always has to be a human to authorize the use of nuclear weapons. The president is ultimately the person who makes the decision. And that gets put in place in 1948. And things have changed. Technology's changed. Politics have changed. Society has changed. Most of us right now have machines do things for us that we're not really thinking about. Humans are the biggest problem in nuclear decision making. We know that humans are not rational. The beauty of machines is that they are not bound by the same cognitive limitations as humans. You could think of machines as decision-making aids. Any system comprised of humans and machines has failure points. I find the notion that an autonomous system is making such a consequential decision, potentially wiping out an entire city to be frankly terrifying. Hitting computers sit in the room and just nudge us could be enough to help humans make better choices. Ease their suffering. Make quick decisions. Même ne se discute pas. Il y a une alternative. 